I think it's really important uh, for everyone to take a moment to think about a park in your own city or in your own town. So close your eyes if you want or not, but think about um, a park, maybe it's your favorite park, maybe it's the one closest to your home. What do you do there? Uh, what do other people do there? What kind of facilities does it have? What kind of uh, features, structures does it have? And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through uh, the presentation. So once you have a park in, in mind, um, let's begin. And uh, as we all know, cities are one of the most transformed uh, forms of landscapes in the world. We have uh, pavement, buildings, traffic, pollution, um, and all of these things have displaced the natural ecosystems that used to be there. And with that, um, the natural processes that used to exist in those areas have been transformed greatly. But we're all pretty much aware of this. And we're also aware of the need for uh, nature-based solutions. Um, we are now starting this year in the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, COP26 is trying to uh, get countries to agree to stop deforestation, to protect and restore nature. And here at Amsterdam International Water Week, blue-green deals with integrated solutions is the main theme. So this is also something that we're generally aware of, the need to um, restore and promote natural systems. No place needs nature more than cities, I would argue. Why? A whole range of benefits. Quality of life, mental health, um, environmental quality, water management, stormwater runoff, carbon sequestration, climate resilience, and on and on. Uh, the benefits or the ecosystem services that nature provides um, are well documented individually uh, in specific uh, locations. And um, in cities, I would argue, um, these benefits are needed more uh, than anywhere else because of the concentration of of humans living there because of the landscape transformation that has taken place. Um, and, oh. Okay, this is an old version. Okay, that's fine. Um, then uh, I'll stay here for a bit. Um, and uh, to measure all of these ecosystem services, there are a growing number of tools available. Um, that try to capture multiple ecosystem services at the same time um, using a variety of methods um, and trying to quantify them and perhaps even monetize them or value them. Um, before I talk about the case study, um, the first part of the research was uh, evaluating, comparing, screening, uh, and reviewing some of these tools uh, that are out there already to uh, measure their capacity for um, measuring um, ecosystem health, which is a vital uh, condition for obtaining these services. Um, also for the amount, the quantity of ecosystem services that each tool can be, uh, that, that each tool can measure, um, whether it takes into account uncertainty, whether it's scalable, things like that uh, were, were used as criteria to evaluate these, these growing number of tools. And uh, after this uh, evaluation, um, one of the tools, which I will uh, tell you soon, it was then applied to a case study here in Amsterdam to, uh, to measure its effectiveness, to see whether uh, it can capture uh, a variety of ecosystem services from a park such as Park Frankendile. Who's been here? Who's been to this park? Two, three, four, <laughs> five. Um, so as you know, it's uh, only three kilometers from here, short bike ride. Uh, it's almost 23 hectares, and um, yeah, applying this tool, uh, which was the eye tree tool, usually, there usually is a slide here with the eye tree and explains about it, but basically um, what it does is it combines land use in the park with uh, tree dimensions, such as um, circumference of the tree trunk at chest level, uh, height of the tree, and species, and combining this with uh, data obtained from um, the open data website of the municipality of Amsterdam come up with uh, a pretty good idea of the trees and the landscape that exists in this park. And having this information using the eye tree, um, then you can start to quantify these ecosystem services that are coming out of the park. A little bit of information about eye tree. Um, 
first developed in the US, but now available in more than 30 countries. Um, it's a family of tools, and as the name suggests, the focus is mostly on trees. Um, it takes tree parameters, uh, like I mentioned, species, uh, circumference, height, and others, uh, combines it with um, land use uh, categories in GIS, and through the web and app or Excel, you can um, create an inventory of trees and land uses in a given area, and then use that to uh, calculate um, current uh, ecosystem services being delivered for a wide range of benefits. This is just one example, uh, air pollution removal. The triangles signify uh, the quantity of air pollution removal that is being um, absorbed by the trees in the park. The blue bars is the value, the economic value of that removal of air pollution. And this is just one of the uh, benefits that was uh, quantified. Another was carbon sequestration, uh, here according to species, and also, uh, again, the triangles is the quantity, and the blue bars are uh, the economic value of that. Um, the economic cost of carbon uh, was used to calculate this. Um, but then um, we also try to combine um, other uh, methods out there um, where the eye tree was lacking to include, for example, local cooling effect of the park. Um, and the final uh, result of this was a value case of the park. Uh, on the top, you see regulating ecosystem services. Um, on the bottom, you see cultural ecosystem services. And this dotted line it represents those that were not able to be uh, monetized. But importantly, or crucially, they still remain in the value case because, as we all know, the value of nature is not just in what can be monetized or quantified, but also in a lot of different uh, services and benefits that um, we enjoy every day but may at this moment not have uh, an economic value or that economic value might not be well understood yet. Um, and what does this mean? Here's the growing number of tools uh, that... Uh, that have been developed over the past few years, they go beyond individual uh, assessments of ecosystem services because these tools try to capture and quantify multiple services at the same time. Multiple benefits, their uh, aim is to be uh, flexible across different landscapes um, for different purposes. Um, so these were the tools that were uh, evaluated in, in the first part of the research, and as I mentioned, the iTree is the one that uh, was chosen due to a high score based on specific criteria to uh, move on to uh, application in the field. What does this mean for uh, the park that you have in your mind from your town, from your city, in your community? Well, taking a measurement uh, for the iTree tool is a nice excuse to just give a tree a hug. The next time you're hugging a tree, just tell someone you're doing citizen science. Um, it's a way for the community to participate in um, ecosystem services assessment. Um, it allows communities to appreciate uh, the nature, the trees that they have in their own community, um, to begin to understand the value uh, of that nature. Um, and by participating in the process, uh, transforms the relationship between humans and nature into something um, where you know, the value is a little bit more uh, visible, a little bit more felt, and then that can lead to um, advocacy, protection of parks in cities, um, promoting new uh, natural areas in, in cities um, by creating this link between uh, community participation, citizen science, uh, and open data. And so I leave you with uh, this quote, and I just want to say thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Very well done, time-wise. So, okay, yeah, and also very interesting, of course. Um, any questions to Oscar? Yes. Wow. Let's do the same. Hi. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, when you're in an urban planning uh, system, eh, do people value more this regulatory or this cultural uh, system 
And, or or how, do, how would you justify it or how would you, uh, you know, value it? That's a great question. Um, the regulatory is definitely easier to quantify and monetize. You can, um, there's, a carbon, there's economic costs for carbon, um, there's um, economic costs of air pollution, and so the removal of these things um, can be more easily monetized. The cultural, that's the tricky part. And, I th and based on surveys, um, that's what communities and residents appreciate the most because that's the one that they experience. They don't see um, PM10 being removed from the air, but they do enjoy the spiritual and recreational aspects of the park. Um, so I would say, to answer your question, I would say that is the one that's being most valued, but that is the one that is being uh, less valorized. Hi, Oscar. Thanks for your presentation. I just have a question related to, to the trees. <laughs> because uh, you use the trees as a lever to clean the air, right? Mm -hmm. How long does it take to see an immediate positive effect? Because trees can take really long to, to grow. Indeed. Good question. Um, and that's why the circumference of the tree trunk is such a, a crucial parameter for the eye tree. Because young trees are very narrow, and then as they grow older, um, they yeah, absorb more con uh, cover carbon, can um, do all the services that I mentioned. How much time does it take? I mean, once the tree is planted, it already starts uh, functioning, but at a very uh, low level. Um, yeah, ideally, you get a fully mature tree after 20 years, and that's when it's, uh, it's maximum capacity for delivering these services. Um, but that's what the eye tree tries to calculate by measuring um, tree circumference as a proxy for a tree age. Hi, uh, Hi, thanks for the nice presentation. I was wondering how does these kind of projects need to compete with uh, the need for building houses in cities? Good question. And uh, the, in the, how this research got started was because cities are, are such competitive places for different uses. Um, and to build a shopping mall or to build houses is clear economic value. You can put it in a spreadsheet and, and you can compare and see what makes most sense and, and then build it. And basically, uh, until recently, nature didn't have even a fighting chance. Uh, they didn't have a seat at the table or a level playing field because it just wasn't being put into that same spreadsheet. So some would argue nature has intrinsic value. You shouldn't even try to monetize it. And I understand that agreement. But when it comes to planning decisions and decisions are being made on an economic basis, this at least puts uh, nature in the same discussion. Uh, now, the results I present are a bit undervalued. I can explain why later, why it's a very conservative estimate, but at least it's starting to um, bring nature into that discussion so you can then uh, realistically compare um, all the benefits and services that you get and compare that with other uses. More questions. So I, I have a, uh, myself a question which relates to this. Yes. So uh, about uh, the economic effect or the monetized effect on real estate. Mm. Uh, there's also a positive effect. If you create a nice park in a neighborhood, the value of the houses and the, and the buildings become 10, 20 percent higher than if the park wouldn't be there. And the, the famous example is the High Line in New York. Mm -hmm. yeah, an old railroad was really reconstructed in a green uh, track through, yeah. through the city, and I think the buildings doubled in value there because yeah. of that. Do you include that in your uh, system? I do not, actually. It's one of the questions uh, during the research was whether to include it or not. Um, we didn't because, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's so variable across different areas. Um, and um, it wasn't something that was, um, let's say, emanating from the park. It wasn't uh, a regulatory or cultural service that could be enjoyed within the park's you know, boundaries. So we decided to exclude it, but yeah. But I think it's one of the most important uh, factors because it really creates ownership of the neighborhood Absolutely. to really have the park. So, yeah. Agreed. Um, from a serious game perspective, quite often 
you try to add um, levers and switches and buttons on the town or something like that. And I wonder from an air quality perspective, is there some sort of magic indicator that you can give to, if you, have one, if you add that park plus 10 other parks, this is how much your air quality is gonna go up in your town kind of thing? Yeah, and I was listening to your presentation yesterday, also thinking about um, the role that trees could play in your game. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways, uh, different parameters that you can change. Um, some species of trees are much better at uh, cooling than others, or air pollution removal, or stormwater runoff because of their root structure. So it, it's, and it's endless, the combinations that you can do. Um, and also a lot depends on the land use category, whether a tree is in a one by one patch of dirt or whether it's in an actual field um, surrounded by grass and other species. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, that's, that would be a fun game to play actually. What, uh, what combinations of trees can get the most air pollution or other services? Yeah, it's more of a remark rather than a question in that I've been in Singapore and there they have this um, philosophy, this is for water management specifically, that water has to be active, it has to be beautiful, and it has to be clean. So this beautiful aspect, which is one of those things that you say is not really easy to measure, mm. it's, in their, it's in their policy. So would you think in a way that that, that would also help in uh, also saying if the economic value is not necessarily the best, sure. that that would help in just the whole dialogue? Yeah, um, and Definitely, um, aesthetic is 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 so is hard so hard to quantify. But there's so many um, beneficial, quantifiable aspects that come with making a beautiful uh, park. Um, one other thing to add on top of that, I would add is um, biodiversity. So, of course, should the park be uh, able to have recreational use? Definitely. But what about biodiversity? Are there places where um, uh, different species can just grow wild and you know for pollinators for insects and so that's something else um, that I would also consider when trying to figure out the perfect park. Okay last question for Anne-Marie. Yeah, you had this nice slide about all these evaluation systems mm. um, uh, and you choose one uh, specify, specific for trees uh, if I understand the name uh, but do you think it's, they should be more integrated than they are now? Great question. And there was a slide there also showing a little bit of the evalu evaluation methodology. Um, yeah, that I think it would be a great next step would be to, let's say, uh, combine the eye tree, which focuses on trees, with uh, BEST, uh, which uh, focuses more on um, stormwater management, on blue-green infrastructure. Still yeah, still fragmented at the moment. Um, I think, though, uh, there's a recent study from Leiden University measuring some of these benefits, not all, uh, in The Hague, citywide, combining different methods. Um, so uh, not just for one park and not just one tool, and I think that's, that's the logical next step, and I hope to see more of that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oscar, thank for you. your interesting uh, uh, presentation and your nice interaction with the audience. <laughs> so let's okay. give him a hand. Thank you.